Chapter 10 The Working Day Section 1 The Limits of the Working Day We began with the assumption that labor power is bought and sold at its value. Its value, like that of all other commodities, is determined by the labor time necessary to produce it. If it takes six hours to produce the average daily means of subsistence of the worker, he must work an average of six hours a day to produce his daily labor power, or to reproduce the value received as a result of its sale. The necessary part of his working day amounts to six hours, and is therefore, other things being equal, a given quantity. But with this, the extent of the working day itself is not yet given. Let us assume that a line A to B, with six segments, represents the length of the necessary labor time, say six hours. If the labor is prolonged beyond AB by one, three, or six hours, we get three other lines, working day number one, A to B with six segments, and B to C with one segment, working day number two, A to B with six segments, and B to C with three segments, and working day number three, A to B with six segments, and B to C with another six segments which represent three different working days of 7, 9, and 12 hours. The extension BC of the line AB represents the length of the surplus labor. As the working day is AB plus BC, or A to C, it varies with the variable magnitude BC. Since AB is constant, the ratio of BC to AB can always be calculated. In working day number 1, it is 1 sixth, in number 2, 3 sixths, and in working day number 3, 6 sixths of AB. Since further, the ratio of surplus labor time to necessary labor time determines the rate of surplus value, the latter is given by the ratio of BC to AB. It amounts, in the three different working days, respectively to 16 and 2 thirds, 50 and 100 percent. On the other hand, the rate of surplus value alone would not give us the extent of the working day. If this rate were 100 percent, the working day might be of 8, 10, 12 or more hours. It would indicate that the two constituent parts of the working day, necessary labor time and surplus labor time, were equal in extent, but not how long each of these two constituent parts was. The working day is thus not a constant, but a variable quantity. One of its parts certainly is determined by the labor time required for the reproduction of the labor power of the worker himself, but its total varies with the duration of the surplus labor. The working day is therefore capable of being determined, but in and for itself indeterminate. Although the working day is not a fixed but a fluid quantity, it can, on the other hand, vary only within certain limits. The minimum limit, however, cannot be determined. Of course, if we make the extension line BC, or the surplus labor, equal to zero, we have a minimum limit, i.e. the part of the day in which the worker must necessarily work for his own maintenance. Under the capitalist mode of production, however, this necessary labor can form only a part of the working day. The working day can never be reduced to this minimum. On the other hand, the working day does have a maximum limit. It cannot be prolonged beyond a certain point. The maximum limit is conditioned by two things. First, by the physical limits to labor power. Within the 24 hours of the natural day, a man can only expend a certain quantity of his vital force. Similarly, a horse can work regularly for only eight hours a day. During part of the day, the vital force must rest, sleep. During another part, the man has to satisfy other physical needs, to feed, wash, and clothe himself. Besides these purely physical limitations, the extension of the working day encounters moral obstacles. The worker needs time in which to satisfy his intellectual and social requirements, and the extent and the number of these requirements is conditioned by the general level of civilization. The length of the working day therefore fluctuates within boundaries both physical and social, but these limiting conditions are of a very elastic nature and allow a tremendous amount of latitude. So we find working days of many different lengths, of 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, and 18 hours. The capitalist has bought the labor power at its daily value. The use value of the labor power belongs to him throughout one working day. He has thus acquired the right to make the worker work for him during one day. But what is a working day? At all events, it is less than a natural day. How much less? The capitalist has his own views of this point of no return, the necessary limit of the working day. As a capitalist, he is only capital personified. His soul is the soul of capital. But capital has one sole driving force, the drive to valorize itself, to create surplus value, to make its constant part, the means of production, absorb the greatest possible amount of surplus labor. Capital is dead labor which, vampire-like, lives only by sucking living labor, and lives the more the more labor it sucks.
The time during which the worker works is the time during which the capitalist consumes the labor power he has bought from him. If the worker consumes his disposable time for himself, he robs the capitalist. The capitalist therefore takes his stand on the law of commodity exchange. Like all other buyers, he seeks to extract the maximum possible benefit from the use value of his commodity. Suddenly, however, there arises the voice of the worker, which had previously been stifled in the sound and fury of the production process. The commodity I have sold you differs from the ordinary crowd of commodities in that its use creates value, a greater value than it costs. That's why you bought it. What appears on your side as the valorization of capital is on my side an excess expenditure of labor power. You and I know on the market only one law, that of the exchange of commodities, and the consumption of the commodity belongs not to the seller who parts with it, but to the buyer who acquires it. The use of my daily labor power therefore belongs to you. But by means of the price you pay for it every day, I must be able to reproduce it every day, thus allowing myself to sell it again. Apart from the natural deterioration through age, etc., I must be able to work tomorrow with the same normal amount of strength, health, and freshness as today. You are constantly preaching to me the gospel of saving and abstinence. Very well, like a sensible, thrifty owner of property, I will husband my soul wealth, my labor power, and abstain from wasting it foolishly. Every day I will spend, set in motion, transfer into labor only as much of it as is compatible with its normal duration and healthy development. By an unlimited extension of the working day, you may in one day use up a quantity of labor power greater than I can restore in three. What you gain in labor, I lose in the substance of labor. Using my labor and despoiling it are quite different things. If the average length of time an average worker can live, while doing a reasonable amount of work, is 30 years, the value of my labor power, which you pay me from day to day, is 1 over 365 times 30, or 1 over 10,950 of its total value. But if you consume it in 10 years, you pay me daily 1 10,950th instead of 1 3,650th of its total value, i.e. only one-third of its daily value, and you therefore rob me every day of two-thirds of the value of my commodity. You pay me for one day's labor power while you use three days of it. That is against our contract and the law of commodity exchange. I therefore demand a working day of normal length, and I demand it without any appeal to your heart, for in money matters, sentiment is out of place. You may be a model citizen, perhaps a member of the RSPCA, and you may be in the odor of sanctity as well, but the thing you represent when you come face to face with me has no heart in its breast. What seems to throb there is my own heartbeat. I demand a normal working day because, like every other seller, I demand the value of my commodity. We see, then, that, leaving aside certain extremely elastic restrictions, the nature of commodity exchange itself imposes no limit to the working day, no limit to surplus labor. The capitalist maintains his rights as a purchaser when he tries to make the working day as long as possible, and, where possible, to make two working days out of one. On the other hand, the peculiar nature of the commodity sold implies a limit to its consumption by the purchaser, and the worker maintains his right as a seller when he wishes to reduce the working day to a particular normal length. There is here, therefore, an antimony of right against right, both equally bearing the seal of the law of exchange. Between equal rights, force decides. Hence, in the history of capitalist production, the establishment of a norm for the working day presents itself as a struggle over the limits of that day, a struggle between collective capital, i.e. the class of capitalists, and collective labor, i.e. the working class. Section 2. The Voracious Appetite for Surplus Labor Manufacturer and Boyard. Capital did not invent surplus labor. Wherever a part of society possesses the monopoly of the means of production, the worker, free or unfree, must add to the labor time necessary for his own maintenance an extra quantity of labor time in order to produce the means of subsistence for the owner of the means of production. Whether this proprietor be an Athenian Carlos Carathos, an Etruscan theocrat, a Chivis Romanus, a Norman baron, an American slave owner, a Wallachian boyar, a modern landlord, or a capitalist. It is, however, clear that in any economic formation of society where the use value rather than the exchange value of the product predominates, surplus labor will be restricted by a more or less confined set of needs, and that no boundless thirst for surplus labor will arise from the character of production itself. Hence, in antiquity, Overwork becomes frightful only when the aim is to obtain exchange value in its independent monetary shape, i.e. in the production of gold and silver. The recognized form of overwork here is forced labor until death. 
One only needs to read Diodorus Siculus. Nevertheless, these are exceptions in antiquity. But as soon as peoples whose production still moves within the lower forms of slave labor, the corvée, etc., are drawn into a world market dominated by the capitalist mode of production, whereby the sale of their products for export develops into their principal interest, the civilized horrors of overwork are grafted onto the barbaric horrors of slavery, serfdom, etc. Hence, the Negro labor in the southern states of the American Union preserved a moderately patriarchal character as long as production was chiefly directed to the satisfaction of immediate local requirements. But in proportion as the export of cotton became of vital interest to those states, the overworking of the Negro, and sometimes the consumption of his life in seven years of labor, became a factor in a calculated and calculating system. It was no longer a question of obtaining from him a certain quantity of useful products, but rather the production of surplus value itself. The same is true of the corvée, in the Danubian principalities, for instance. The comparison of the appetite for surplus labor in the Danubian principalities with the same appetite as found in the English factories has a special interest, because the corvée presents surplus labor in an independent and immediately perceptible form. Suppose the working day consists of six hours of necessary labor and six hours of surplus labor. Then the free worker gives the capitalist six times six, or thirty-six hours of surplus labor, every week. It is the same as if he worked three days in the week for himself and three days in the week gratis for the capitalist. But this fact is not directly visible. Surplus labor and necessary labor are mingled together. I can therefore express the same relation by saying that, for instance, in every minute, the worker works 30 seconds for himself and 30 seconds for the capitalist, etc. It is otherwise with the corvée. The necessary labor which the Wallachian peasant performs for his own maintenance is distinctly marked off from his surplus labor on behalf of the boyar. The one he does on his own field, the other on the seigneurial estate. Both parts of the labor time thus exist independently, side by side with each other. In the corvée, the surplus labor is accurately marked off from the necessary labor. However, this clearly alters nothing in the quantitative relation of surplus labor to necessary labor. Three days surplus labor in the week remain three days that yield no equivalent to the worker himself, whether the surplus labor is called corvée or wage labor. But in the capitalist, the appetite for surplus labor appears in the drive for an unlimited extension of the working day, while in the boyard, it appears more simply in a direct hunt for days of corvée. In the Danubian principalities, the corvée was linked with rents in kind and other appurtenances of serfdom, but it formed the most important tribute paid to the ruling class. Where this was the case, the corvée rarely arose from serfdom. Instead, serfdom arose, inversely, from the corvée. This is what took place in the Romanian provinces. Their original mode of production was based on communal property, but not communal property in its Slav or Indian form. Part of the land was cultivated independently as free private property by the members of the commune, another part, the agiar publicus, was cultivated by them in common. The products of this common labor served partly as a reserve fund against bad harvests and other misfortunes, partly as a kind of state treasury to cover the costs of war, religion, and other communal expenses. In the course of time, military and clerical dignitaries usurped the communal land, and along with this the obligations owed to it. The labor of the free peasants on their communal land was transformed into corvée, performed for the thieves who had taken that land. This corvée soon developed into a servile relationship existing in point of fact, though not legally, until Russia, the liberator of the world, raised it to the level of a law on the pretext of abolishing serfdom. The Code of the Corvée, which the Russian general Kisilov proclaimed in 1831, was of course dictated by the boyars themselves. Thus, at one stroke, Russia both conquered the magnates of the Danubian principalities and earned the applause of cretinous liberals throughout Europe. According to the Reglement Organique, as this code of the corvée is called, every Wallachian peasant owes to the so-called landlord, besides a mass of payment in kind, which are specified in detail, the following. 1. 12 days of labor in general. 2. 1 day of field labor. 3. 1 day of wood carrying. Taken together, this is 14 days in the year. However, with deep insight into political economy, the working day is not taken in its ordinary sense, but as the working day necessary to the production of an average daily product, and that average daily product is determined in such a sly manner that even a cyclops would be unable to finish the job within 24 hours. Therefore, the Reglement itself declares, dryly and with true Russian irony, that by 12 working days one must understand the product of the manual labor of 36 days, 
by one day of field labor, three days, and by one day of wood carrying, similarly, three times as much. The sum total is now 42 days of corvée. To this had to be added the so-called jobazio, service due to the Lord for emergency requirements. In proportion to the size of its population, every village has to furnish annually a definite contingent to the jobazio. This additional corvée is estimated at 14 days for each Wallachian peasant. Thus, the prescribed corvée amounts to 56 working days every year. But because of the severe climate, the agricultural year in Wallachia numbers only 210 days, of which 40 for Sundays and holidays, and 30 on an average for bad weather, together 70 days, do not count. 140 working days remain. The ratio of the corvée to the necessary labor, 56 over 84, or 66 and two-thirds percent, gives a much smaller rate of surplus value than that which regulates the work of the English agricultural laborer, or factory worker. This is, however, only the legally prescribed corvée, and in a spirit yet more liberal than the English factory acts, the Reglement Organique was able to facilitate its own evasion. After it has made 56 days out of 12, the nominal day's work of each of the 56 corvée days is again so arranged that a portion of it must fall on the next day. In one day, for instance, an amount of land must be weeded which would require twice as much time for this work, particularly on the maize plantations. The legal day's work for some kinds of agricultural labor can be interpreted in such a way that the day begins in the month of May and ends in the month of October. For Moldavia, the regulations are even stricter. The twelve corvée days of the Reglement Organique, cried a boyard drunk with victory, amount to 365 days in the year. If the Reglement Organique of the Danubian principalities was a positive expression of the appetite for surplus labor which every paragraph legalized, the English factory acts are the negative expression of the same appetite. These laws curb capital's drive towards a limitless draining away of labor power by forcibly limiting the working day on the authority of the state, but a state ruled by capitalist and landlord. Apart from the daily, more threatening advance of the working class movement, the limiting of factory labor was dictated by the same necessity as forced the manufacturing of English fields with guano, the same blind desire for profit that in the one case exhausted the soil had in the other case seized hold of the vital force of the nation at its roots. Periodical epidemics speak as clearly on this point as the diminishing military standard of height in France and Germany. The Factory Act of 1850 now in force, as of 1867, allows 10 hours for the average working day, i.e. for the first five days, 12 hours from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., including half an hour for breakfast and an hour for dinner, thus leaving 10 and a half working hours, and 8 hours for Saturday, from 6 a.m. to 2 p.m., of which half an hour is subtracted for breakfast. 60 working hours are left, 10 and one half for each of the first five days, 7 and one half for the last. Certain guardians of these laws are appointed, factory inspectors directly under the Home Secretary, and their reports are published every six months by order of Parliament. They therefore provide regular and official statistics of the voracious appetite of the capitalists for surplus labor. Let us listen for a moment to the factory inspectors. Quote, the fraudulent mill owner begins work a quarter of an hour, sometimes more, sometimes less, before 6 a.m., and leaves off a quarter of an hour, sometimes more, sometimes less, after 6 p.m. He takes five minutes from the beginning and from the end of the half hour nominally allowed for breakfast, and ten minutes at the beginning and end of the hour nominally allowed for dinner. He works for a quarter of an hour, sometimes more, sometimes less, after 2 p.m. on Saturday. Thus, his gain is, before 6 a.m., 15 minutes, after 6 p.m., 15 minutes, at breakfast time, 10 minutes, at dinner time, 20 minutes, and throughout the total day, 60 minutes. The total for the five days being 300 minutes, on Saturday before 6 a.m. being 15, at breakfast time being 10, after 2 p.m. being 15, the total for Saturday being 40 minutes, and so the weekly total being 340 minutes, or 5 hours and 40 minutes weekly, which, multiplied by 50 working weeks in the year, allowing two for holidays and occasional stoppages, is equal to 27 working days. Five minutes a day increased work multiplied by weeks are equal to two and a half days of produce in the year. An additional hour a day gained by the small installments before 6 a.m. and after 6 p.m. and at the beginning and end of the times nominally fixed for meals is nearly equivalent to working 13 months in the year. End quote. Crises during which production is interrupted and the factories work short time, i.e. only for part of the week, naturally do not affect the tendency to extend the working day. 
The less business there is, the more profit has to be made on the business done. The less time spent in work, the more of that time has to be turned into surplus labor time. This is how the factory inspectors report on the period of crisis from 1857 to 1858. Quote, It may seem inconsistent that there should be any overworking at a time when trade is so bad, but that very badness leads to a transgression by unscrupulous men. They get the extra profit of it in the last half year, says Leonard Horner. 122 mills in my district have been given up. 143 were found standing, yet overwork is continued beyond the legal hours. For a great part of the time, says Mr. Howell, owing to the depression of trade, many factories were altogether closed, and a still greater number were working short time. I continue, however, to receive about the usual number of complaints that half, or three-quarters of an hour in the day, are snatched from the workers by encroaching upon the times professedly allowed for rest and refreshment. The same phenomenon was repeated on a smaller scale during the frightful cotton crisis from 1861 to 1865. It is sometimes advanced by way of excuse, when persons are found at work in a factory either at meal hour or at some illegal time, that they will not leave the mill at the appointed hour, and that compulsion is necessary to force them to cease work, cleaning their machinery, etc., especially on Saturday afternoons. But if the hands remain in a factory after the machinery has ceased to revolve, they would not have been so employed if sufficient time had been set apart specially for cleaning, etc., either before 6 a.m. or before 2 p.m. on Saturday afternoons. The profit to be gained by it, overworking in violation of the act, appears to be, to many, a greater temptation than they can resist. They calculate upon the chance of not being found out, and when they see the small amounts of penalty and costs, which those who have been convicted have had to pay, they find that if they should be detected there will still be a considerable balance of gain. In cases where the additional time is gained by a multiplication of small thefts in the course of the day, there are insuperable difficulties to the inspectors making out a case. These small thefts of capital from the workers' meal times and recreation times are also described by the factory inspectors as petty pilferings of minutes, snatching a few minutes, or in the technical language of the workers, nibbling and cribbling at meal times. It is evident that in this atmosphere, the formation of surplus value by surplus labor is no secret. If you allow me, as I was informed by a highly respectable master, to work only ten minutes in the day overtime, you put one thousand a year in my pocket. Moments are the elements of profit. In this connection, nothing is more characteristic than the designation of the workers who work full-time as full-timers and the children under 13 who are only allowed to work six hours as half-timers. The worker is here nothing more than a personified labor time. All individual distinctions are obliterated in that between full-timers and half-timers. Section 3 branches of English industry, without legal limits to exploitation. So far, we have observed the drive towards the extension of the working day, and the werewolf-like hunger for surplus labor in an area where capital's monstrous outrages, unsurpassed, according to an English bourgeois economist, by the cruelties of the Spaniards to the American redskins, caused it at last to be bound by the chains of legal regulations. Now let us cast a glance at certain branches of production in which the exploitation of labor is either still unfettered even now, or was so yesterday. Quote, Mr. Broughton Charlton, county magistrate, declared, as chairman of a meeting held at the Assembly Rooms, Nottingham, on the 14th of January, 1860, that there was an amount of privation and suffering among that portion of the population connecting with the lace trade, unknown in the other parts of the kingdom, indeed in the civilized world. Children of nine or ten years are dragged from their squalid beds at two, three, or four o'clock in the morning and compelled to work for a bare subsistence until ten, eleven, or twelve at night, their limbs wearing away, their frames dwindling, their faces whitening, and their humanity absolutely sinking into a stone-like torpor, utterly horrible to contemplate. We are not surprised, he went on, that Mr. Mallet or any other manufacturer should stand forward in protest against discussion. The system, as the Reverend Montague Valpy describes it, is one of unmitigated slavery, socially, physically, morally, and spiritually. What can be thought of a town which holds a public meeting to petition that the period of labor for men shall be diminished to 18 hours a day? We declaim against the Virginian and Carolinian cotton planters. Is their black market, their lash, and their barter of human flesh more detestable than this slow sacrifice of humanity which takes place in order that veils and collars may be fabricated for the benefit of capitalists? End quote. 
The potteries of Staffordshire have, during the last 22 years, formed the subject matter of three parliamentary inquiries. The results were embodied in Mr. Scriven's report of 1841 to the Children's Employment Commissioners, in Dr. Greenhow's report of 1860, published by order of the Medical Officer of the Privy Council, and lastly in Mr. Long's report of 1862, printed in the Children's Employment Commission first report, dated the 13th of June, 1863. For my purpose, it is enough to take some of the deposition of the exploited children themselves from the reports of 1860 and 1863. From the children, we may deduce the situation of the adults, especially the girls and women, and in the branch of industry indeed, alongside which cotton spinning appears as a very agreeable and healthy occupation. William Wood, nine years old, quote, was seven years and ten months old when he began to work, end quote. He ran molds, carried ready-molded articles into the drying room, afterwards bringing back the empty mold from the very beginning. He came to work every day in the week at 6 a.m. and left off at about 9 p.m. Quote, I work till 9 o'clock at night six days in the week. I have done so for the last seven or eight weeks. Fifteen hours of labor for a child of seven. J. Murray, 12 years of age, says, quote, I turn jigger and run molds. I come at six, sometimes I come at four. I worked all night last night till six o'clock this morning. I have not been in bed since the night before last. There were eight or nine other boys working last night. All but one have come this morning. I get three shillings and sixpence. I don't get any more for working at night. I worked two nights last week. Fernie Ho, a boy of ten. I've not always an hour for dinner. I have only half an hour sometimes, on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Dr. Greenhouse states that the average life expectancy in the pottery districts of Stoke-on-Trent and Walstanton is extraordinarily low. Although only 36.6% of the male population over the age of 20 are employed in the potteries in the district of Stoke, and 30.4% in Walstanton, more than half the deaths among men of that age in the first district, and nearly two-fifths in the second district, are the result of pulmonary diseases among the potters. Dr. Boothroyd, a medical practitioner at Hanley, says, quote, Each successive generation of potters is more dwarfed and less robust than the preceding one. Similarly, another doctor, Mr. McBean, states, Since I began to practice among the potters 25 years ago, I have observed a marked degeneration, especially shown in diminution of stature and breadth. These statements are taken from Dr. Greenhouse's report of 1860. From the report of the commissioners in 1863, the following, Dr. J.T. Arledge, senior physician of the North Staffordshire Infirmary, says, the potters as a class, both men and women, represent a degenerated population, both physically and morally. They are, as a rule, stunted in growth, ill-shaped and frequently ill-formed in the chest. They become prematurely old and are certainly short-lived. They are phlegmatic and bloodless and exhibit their debility of constitution by obstinate attacks of dyspepsia and disorders of the liver and kidneys and by rheumatism. But of all the diseases, they are especially prone to chest disease, to pneumonia, phthisis, bronchitis, and asthma. One form would appear peculiar to them, and is known as potter's asthma, or potter's consumption. Scrofula attacking the glands or bones or other parts of the body is a disease of two-thirds or more of the potters. That the degenerescence of the population of this district is not even greater than it is, is due to the constant recruiting from the adjacent country and intermarriages with more healthy races. Mr. Charles Parsons, until recently the house surgeon of the same hospital, writes in a letter to Commissioner Long, amongst other things, quote, I can only speak from personal observation and not from statistical data, but I do not hesitate to assert that my indignation has been aroused again and again at the sight of poor children whose health has been sacrificed to gratify the avarice of either parents or employers, end quote. He enumerates the causes of the diseases of the potters and sums them up in the phrase, long hours. In their report, the commissioners expressed the hope that a manufacture which has assumed so prominent a place in the whole world will not long be subject to the remark that its great success is accompanied with the physical deterioration, widespread bodily suffering, and early death of the workpeople, by whose labor and skill such great results have been achieved. And all that holds of the potteries in England is true of those in Scotland. The manufacture of matches dates from 1833, from the discovery of the method of applying phosphorus to the match itself. Since 1845, this branch of industry has developed rapidly in England and has spread out from the thickly populated parts of London to the cities of Manchester, Birmingham, Liverpool, Bristol, Norwich, Newcastle, and Glasgow. It has brought with it tetanus, a disease which a Vienna doctor already discovered in 1845 to be peculiar to the makers of matches. Half the workers are children under 13 and young persons under 18. 
The manufacture of matches, on account of its unhealthiness and unpleasantness, has such a bad reputation that only the most miserable part of the working class, half-starved widows and so forth, deliver up their children to it. Their ragged, half-starved, untaught children, quote from the Children's Employment Commission First Report, published in 1863. Of the witnesses examined by Commissioner White, 270 were under 18, 50 under 10, 10 only 8, and 5 only 6 years old. With the working day ranging from 12 to 14 or 15 hours, night labor, irregular meal times, and meals mostly taken in the workrooms themselves, pestilent with phosphorus, Dante would have found the worst horrors in his inferno surpassed in this industry. In the manufacture of wallpaper, the coarser sorts are printed by machine, the finer by hand, block printing. The most active business months are from the beginning of October to the end of April. During this time, the work often lasts, almost interruptedly, from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m., or further on into the night. J. Leach's deposition, quote, Last winter, six out of 19 girls were away from ill health at one time from overwork. I have to bawl at them to keep them awake, end quote. W. Duffy, quote, I have seen when the children could none of them keep their eyes open for the work. Indeed, none of us could, end quote. J. Lightborn, quote, I am 13. We worked last winter till nine in the evening, and the winter before till ten. I used to cry with sore feet every night last winter. End quote. G. Abston, quote, That boy of mine, when he was seven years old, I used to carry him on my back through the snow, and he used to have sixteen hours a day. I've often knelt down to feed him as he stood by the machine, for he could not leave it or stop. End quote. Smith, the managing partner of a Manchester factory, quote, We, he means his hands, who work for us, Work on, with no stoppage for meals, so that the day's work of ten and a half hours is finished by 4.30 p.m., and all after that is overtime. Does this Mr. Smith take no meals himself during the ten and a half hours? We, this same Smith, seldom leave off working before 6 p.m. He means leave off from consuming our labor power machines, so that we, the same man again, are really working overtime the whole year round. For all these, children and adults alike... 152 children and young persons and 140 adults, the average work for the last 18 months has been at the very least 7 days 5 hours, or 78 and a half hours a week. For the 6 weeks ending in the 2nd of May this year, 1862, the average was higher, 8 days or 84 hours a week. Despite this, the same Mr. Smith, who is so fond of the plural of majesty, adds, smirking with satisfaction, machine work is not so great. Similarly, the employers in the block printing trade say, hand labor is more healthy than machine work. On the whole, manufacturers are indignantly opposed to the proposal to stop the machines at least during mealtimes. A clause which allowed work between, say, 6 a.m. and 9 p.m., says Mr. Otley, manager of a wallpaper factory in the borough, a district of London, would suit us very well. But the factory hours, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., are not suitable. Our machine is always stopped for dinner. What a generosity! There is no waste of paper and color to speak of, but, he adds sympathetically, I can understand the loss of time not being liked. In the Commission's report, the naive opinion is expressed that the fear in some leading firms of losing time, i.e. the time for appropriating the labor of others, and thereby losing profit, is not a sufficient reason for allowing children under thirteen and young persons under 18 working 12 to 16 hours per day to lose their dinner, nor for giving it to them as coal and water are supplied to the steam engine, soap to wool, oil to the wheel, namely during the process of production itself as merely auxiliary material for the instruments of labor. No other branch of industry in England has preserved up to the present day a method of production as archaic, as pre-Christian, as we see from the poets of the Roman Empire, as baking has. We shall disregard the practice of making bread by machinery, which has only recently begun to make its way here. But capital, as we said earlier, is at first indifferent towards the technical character of the labor process it seizes control of. At the outset, it takes it as it finds it. The incredible adulteration of bread, especially in London, was first revealed by the Committee of the House of Commons on the Adulteration of Articles of Food, published in 1855 to 1856, and by Dr. Hassall's work, Adulterations Detected, 
The consequence of these revelations was the act of the 6th of August, 1860, for preventing the adulteration of articles of food and drink, an inoperative law as it naturally shows the tenderest considerations for every free trader who decides to turn an honest penny by buying and selling adulterated commodities. The committee itself more or less naively formulated its conviction that free trade essentially meant trade with adulterated, or as the English ingeniously put it, sophisticated goods. In fact, this kind of sophistry understands better than Protagoras how to make white black and black white, and better than Eleatics how to demonstrate before your very eyes that everything real is merely apparent. At all events, the committee had directed the attention of the public to its daily bread, and therefore to the baking trade. At the same time, the cry of the London journeymen bakers against their overwork rose in public meetings and petitions to Parliament. The cry was so urgent that Mr. H. S. Tremon here, also a member of the above-mentioned Commission of 1863, was appointed a Royal Commissioner of Inquiry. His report, together with the evidence given, moved the public not in its heart but in its stomach. Englishmen, with their good command of the Bible, knew well enough that man, unless by elective grace a capitalist or a landlord or the holder of a sinecure, is destined to eat his bread in the sweat of his brow, but they did not know that he had to eat daily in his bread a certain quantity of human perspiration mixed with a discharge of abscesses, cobwebs, dead cockroaches, and putrid German yeast, not to mention alum, sand, and other agreeable mineral ingredients." Without any regard for His Holiness' free trade, the hitherto free baking trade was therefore placed under the supervision of state-appointed inspectors at the close of the parliamentary session of 1863, and by the same act of Parliament, work from nine in the evening to five in the morning was forbidden for journeyman bakers under eighteen. The last clause speaks volumes as to the overwork in this old-fashioned, homely line of business. The following is a quote from the first report. The work of a London journeyman baker begins, as a rule, at about eleven at night. At that hour he makes the dough, a laborious process which lasts half an hour to three-quarters of an hour according to the size of the batch or the labor bestowed upon it. He then lies down upon the kneading board, which is also the covering of the trough in which the dough is made, and with a sack under him and another rolled up as a pillow, he sleeps for about a couple of hours. He is then engaged in a rapid and continuous labor for about five hours, throwing out the dough, scaling it off, molding it, and putting it into the oven preparing and baking rolls and fancy bread, taking the batch bread out of the oven and up into the shop, etc., etc. The temperature of a bakehouse ranges from about 75 to upwards of 90 degrees, and in the smaller bakehouses approximates usually to the higher rather than to the lower degree of the heat. When the business of making the bread, rolls, etc. is over, that of its distribution begins, and a considerable portion of the journeymen in the trade, after working hard in the manner described during the night, are upon their legs for many hours during the day, carrying baskets or wheeling handcarts, and sometimes again in the bakehouse, leaving off work at various hours between 1 and 6 p.m. according to the season of the year or the amount and nature of their master's business, while others are again engaged in the bakehouse in bringing out more batches until late in the afternoon. During what is called the London season, the operatives belonging to the full-priced bakers at the west end of the town generally begin work at 11 p.m. and are engaged in making the bread, with one or two short, sometimes very short, intervals of rest, up to eight o'clock the next morning. They are then engaged all day long, up to four, five, six, and as late as seven o'clock in the evening carrying out bread, or sometimes in the afternoon in the bakehouse again assisting in the biscuit making. They may have, after they have done their work, sometimes five or six, sometimes only four or five hours sleep before they begin again. On Fridays they always begin sooner, some at about ten o'clock, and continue in some cases at work either in making or delivering the bread up to eight p.m. on Saturday night but more generally up to four or five o'clock Sunday morning. On Sundays, the men must attend twice or three times during the day for an hour or two to make preparation for the next day's bread. The men employed by the underselling masters, who sell their bread under the full price and who, as already pointed out, comprise three-fourths of the London bakers, have not only to work on the average longer hours, but their work is almost entirely confined to the bakehouse. The underselling masters generally sell their bread in the shop. If they send it out, which is not common, except as supplying Chandler's shops, they usually employ other hands for that purpose. It is not their practice to deliver bread from house to house. Towards the end of the week, the men begin on Thursday night at 10 o'clock and continue on with only slight intermission until late on Saturday evening. End quote. Even the bourgeois, from his standpoint, grasps the position of the underselling masters. Quote, the unpaid labor of the men was made the source whereby the competition was carried on. End quote from George Reed, The History of Baking. 
and the full-priced baker denounces his underselling competitors to the commission of inquiry as thieves of other people's labor and adulterators of the product. Quote, they exist now by first defrauding the public and next getting 18 hours of work out of their men for 12 hours wages. End quote from the first report. The adulteration of bread and the formation of a class of bakers who sell bread for less than its full price are developments which have taken place in England since the beginning of the 18th century, i.e. as soon as the corporate character of the trade was lost and the capitalists stepped behind the nominal master baker in the shape of a miller or flour factor. This laid the foundation for capitalist production in this trade, for the unlimited extension of the working day, and for night work, although the last mention has secured a real foothold only since 1824, even in London. After what has just been said, it'll be understood that the Commission's report classes journeyman bakers among these short-lived workers who, having by good luck escaped the normal decimation of the children of the working class, rarely reach the age of 42. Nevertheless, the baking trade is always overwhelmed with applicants. The sources for the supply of these labor powers to London are Scotland, the agricultural districts of the west of England, and Germany. In the years 1858 to 1860, the journeymen bakers of Ireland organized, at their own expense, huge meetings to agitate against night work and Sunday work. The public, for example at the Dublin meeting of May 1860, supported them with typically Irish warmth. As a result of this movement, a rule of exclusive day labor was successfully established in Wexford, Kilkenny, Clonmel, Waterford, etc. Quote, in Limerick, where the grievances of the journeymen are demonstrated to be excessive, the movement has been defeated by the opposition of the master bakers, the miller bakers being the greatest opponents. The example of Limerick has led to a retrogression in Ennis and Tipperary. In Cork, where the strongest possible demonstration of feeling took place, the masters, by exercising their power of turning the men out of employment, have defeated the movement. In Dublin, the master bakers have offered the most determined opposition to the movement, and by discountenancing as much as possible the journeymen promoting it, have succeeded in leading the men into acquiescence in Sunday work and night work, contrary to the convictions of the men. End quote from the report of the Committee on the Baking Trade in Ireland for 1861. The Committee of the English Government, a government which, in Ireland, is armed to the teeth, merely remonstrates, in funereal tones it is true, against the implacable master bakers of Dublin, Limerick, Cork, etc., Quote, the committee believe that the hours of labor are limited by natural laws, which cannot be violated with impunity. That for master bakers to induce their workmen, by the fear of losing employment, to violate their religious convictions and their better feelings, to disobey the laws of the land, and to disregard public opinion, this all refers to Sunday labor, is calculated to provoke ill feeling between the workmen and masters, and affords an example dangerous to religion, morality, and social order. The committee believe that any constant work beyond 12 hours a day encroaches on the domestic and private life of the working man and so leads to disastrous moral results, interfering with each man's home and the discharge of his family duties as a son, a brother, a husband, a father. That work beyond 12 hours has a tendency to undermine the health of the working man and so leads to premature old age and death to the great injury of families of working men thus deprived of the care and support of the head of the family when most required. End quote. We have just been in Ireland. On the other side of the channel, in Scotland, the agricultural laborer, the man of the plough, is protesting against his 13 to 14 hours work in a very severe climate, with four hours additional work on Sunday, in that land of Sabbatarians. While simultaneously in London, three railwaymen, a guard, an engine driver, and a signalman, are up before coroner's jury. A tremendous railway accident has dispatched hundreds of passengers into the next world. The negligence of the railway workers is the cause of the misfortune. They declare with one voice before the jury that ten or twelve years before, their labor lasted only eight hours a day. During the last five or six years, they say, it has been screwed up to fourteen, eighteen, and twenty hours, and when the pressure of holiday travelers is especially severe, when excursion trains are put on, their labor often lasts for forty or fifty hours without a break. They are ordinary men, not cyclops. At a certain point, their labor power ran out. Torpor seized them, their brains stopped thinking, their eyes stopped seeing. The thoroughly respectable British jurymen replied with a verdict that sent them to the assizes on a charge of manslaughter. In a mild writer to the verdict, the jury expressed the pious hope that the capitalist railway magnates would in future be more extravagant in the purchase of the necessary number of labor powers, and more abstemious, more self-denying, more thrifty in the extortion of paid labor power. 
From the motley crowd of workers of all callings, ages, and sexes, who throng around us more urgently than did the souls of the slain around Ulysses, on whom we see at a glance the signs of overwork, without referring to the blue books under their arms, let us select two more figures, whose striking contrast proves that all men are alike in the face of capital, a milliner and a blacksmith. In the last week of June 1863, all the London Daily Papers published a paragraph with the sensational heading, Death from Simple Overwork. It dealt with the death of a milliner, Mary Ann Walkley, 20 years old, employed in a highly respectable dressmaking establishment, exploited by a lady with the pleasant name of Elise. The old, often-told story was now revealed once again. These girls work, on an average, 16 and a half hours without a break, during the season often 30 hours, and the flow of their failing labor power is maintained by occasional supplies of sherry, port, or coffee. It was the height of the season. It was necessary, in the twinkling of an eye, to conjure up magnificent dresses for the noble ladies invited to the ball in honor of the newly imported Princess of Wales. Mary Ann Walkley had worked uninterruptedly for twenty-six and one-half hours, with sixty other girls, thirty in each room. The rooms provided only one-third of the necessary quantity of air measured in cubic feet. At night, the girls slept in pairs in the stifling holes into which a bedroom was divided by wooden partitions, and this was one of the better millinery establishments in London. Mary Ann Walkley fell ill on the Friday and died on Sunday, without, to the astonishment of Madame Elise, having finished off the bit of finery she was working on. The doctor, a Mr. Keyes, called too late to the girl's deathbed, made his deposition to the coroner's jury in plain language. Mary Ann Walkley died from long hours of work in an overcrowded workroom and a too small and badly ventilated bedroom. In order to give the doctor a lesson in good manners, the coroner's jury thereupon brought in the verdict that the deceased had died of apoplexy, but there was reason to fear that her death had been accelerated by overwork in an overcrowded workroom. "'Our white slaves!' exclaimed the Morning Star, the organ of the free-trading gentlemen Cobden and Bright. "'Our white slaves, who are toiled into the grave, for the most part, silently pine and die.'" The following is a quote from Dr. Richardson. It is not only in dressmakers' rooms that working to death is the order of the day, but in a thousand other places, and every place I had almost said where a thriving business has to be done. We will take the blacksmith as a type. If the poets are true, there is no man so hearty, so merry as the blacksmith. He rises early and strikes his sparks before the sun. He eats and drinks and sleeps as no other man. Working in moderation, he is in fact in one of the best of human positions, physically speaking. But we follow him into the city or town, and we see the stress of work on that strong man, and what then is his position in the death rate of his country. In Mary Lebone, blacksmiths die at the rate of thirty-one per thousand per annum, or eleven above the mean of male adults of the country in its entirety. The occupation, instinctive almost as a portion of human art, unobjectionable as a branch of human industry, is made by mere excess of work the destroyer of the man. He can strike so many blows per day, walk so many steps, breathe so many breaths, produce so much work, and live an average, say, of fifty years. He is made to strike so many more blows, to walk so many more steps, to breathe so many more breaths per day, and to decrease altogether a fourth of his life. He meets the effort. The result is that producing for a limited time a fourth more work, he dies at thirty-seven for fifty. Section 4 Day Work and Night Work The Shift System Constant capital, the means of production, only exist, considered from the standpoint of the process of valorization, in order to absorb labor, and with every drop of labor, a proportional quantity of surplus labor. Insofar as the means of production fail to do this, their mere existence forms a loss for the capitalist, in a negative sense, for while they lie fallow, they represent a useless advance of capital. This loss becomes a positive one as soon as the interruption of employment necessitates an additional outlay when the work begins again. The prolongation of the working day beyond the limits of the natural day into the night only acts as a palliative. It only slightly quenches the vampire thirst for the living blood of labor. Capitalist production therefore drives, by its inherent nature, towards the appropriation of labor throughout the whole of the 24 hours in the day. But since it is physically impossible to exploit the same individual labor power constantly, during the night as well as the day, capital has to overcome this physical obstacle, 
an alternation becomes necessary between the labor powers used up by day and those used up by night. This can be accomplished in various ways. For instance, it may be arranged that part of the working personnel is employed for one week on day work and for the next week on night work. It is well known that this shift system, this alternation of two sets of the workers, predominated in the full-blooded springtime of the English cotton industry, and that at the present time it still flourishes, among other places, in the cotton-spinning factories of the Moscow Gubernia. This 24-hour process of production exists today as a system in many of the as-yet-free branches of industry in Great Britain, in the blast furnaces, forges, rolling mills, and other metallurgical establishments of England, Wales, and Scotland. Here, the labor process includes a great part of the 24 hours of Sunday, in addition to the 24 hours of the six working days. The workers consist of men and women, adults and children of both sexes. The ages of the children and young persons run through all the intermediate grades, from 8, in some cases from 6, to 18. In some branches of industry, the girls and women work through the night together with the male personnel. Leaving aside the generally harmful effects of night labor, the duration of the process of production, unbroken for 24 hours, offers very welcome opportunities for exceeding the limits of the normal working day, for example in the branches of industry already mentioned, which are themselves very strenuous. The official working day usually comes to 12 hours by night or day for all workers, but the amount of overwork done in excess of this limit is in many cases, to use the words of the official English report, truly fearful. It is impossible, says the report, for any mind to realize the amount of work described in the following passages as being performed by boys of from 9 to 12 years of age, without coming irresistibly to the conclusion that such abuses of the power of parents and of employers can no longer be allowed to exist. The practice of boys working at all by day and night turns, either in the usual course of things or at pressing times, seems inevitably to open the door to their not infrequently working unduly long hours. These hours are indeed, in some cases, not only cruelly but even incredibly long for children. Amongst a number of boys, it will, of course, not infrequently happen that one or more are from some cause absent. When this happens, their place is made up by one or more boys who work in the other turn. That this is a well-understood system is plain from the answer of the manager of some large rolling mills who, when I asked him how the place of the boys absent from their turn was made up, responded, I dare say, sir, you know that as well as I do, and admitted the fact. At a rolling mill where the proper hours were from 6 a.m. to 5.30 p.m., a boy worked about four nights every week till 8.30 p.m. at least, and this for six months. Another, at nine years old, sometimes made three 12-hour shifts running, and when ten is made two days and two nights running. A third, now ten, worked from 6 a.m. till 12 p.m. three nights and till 9 p.m. the other nights. Another, now thirteen, worked from 6 p.m. till 12 noon the next day for a week together, and sometimes for three shifts together. For example, from Monday morning till Tuesday night. Another, now twelve, has worked in an iron foundry at Staveley from 6 a.m. to 12 p.m. for a fortnight on end. Could not do it any more. Quote, George Allensworth, age nine, came here as cellar boy last Friday. Next morning we had to begin at three, so I stopped here all night. Lived five miles off. Slept on the floor of the furnace, overhead with an apron under me, and a bit of jacket over me. The two other days I've been here at 6 a.m. Aye, it is hot in here. Before I came here, I was nearly a year at the same work at some works in the country. Began there, too, at three on Saturday morning. Always did, but was very near home, and could sleep at home. Other days, I began at six in the morning and given over at six or seven in the evening. End quote. Let us now hear how capital itself regards this 24-hour system. The extreme forms of the system, its abuse and the cruel and incredible extension of the working day, are naturally passed over in silence. Capital only speaks of the system in its normal form. Messrs. Naylor and Vickers, steel manufacturers, who employ between 600 and 700 persons, among whom only 10% are under 18, with only 20 boys under 18 working on the night shift, have the following comments to make. Quote, the boys do not suffer from the heat. The temperature is probably from 86 degrees to 90 degrees. At the forges and in the rolling mills, the hands work night and day, in relays, but all the other parts of the work are day work, i.e. from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. In the forge, the hours are from 12 to 12. Some of the hands always work in the night, without any alternation of day and night work. We do not find any difference in the health of those who work regularly by night and those who work by day, and probably people can sleep better if they have the same period of rest than if it has changed. 
About twenty of the boys under the age of eighteen work in the night sets. We could not well do without lads under eighteen working by night. The objection would be the increase in the cost of production. Skilled hands and the heads in every de skilled hands and the heads in every department are difficult to get, but of children we could get any number. But from the small proportion of boys that we employ, the subject, i.e. the subject of restrictions on night work, is of little importance or interest to us. End quote. Mr. J. Ellis, from the firm of Messrs. John Brown and Company, Steel and Iron Works, employing about 3,000 men and boys, part of whose operations, namely iron and heavier steelwork, goes on night and day in shifts, states that in the heavier steelwork, one or two boys are always employed to a score or two men. Their business employs 500 boys under 18, and of these, about a third, or 170, are under the age of 13. With reference to the proposed alteration of the law, Mr. Ellis says, I do not think it would be very objectionable to require that no person under the age of 18 should work more than 12 hours in the 24, but we do not think that any line could be drawn over the age of 12, at which boys could be dispensed with for night work. But we would sooner be prevented from employing boys under the age of 13, or even so high as 14 at all, than not be allowed to employ boys that we do have at night. Those boys who work in the day sets must take their turn in the night sets also. Because the men could not work in the night sets only, it would ruin their health. We think, however, that night work in alternate weeks is no harm. Messrs. Naylor and Vickers, on the other hand, in line with the best interests of their business, took the opposite view, that periodic alternation of night and day labor might well do more harm than continual night labor. We find the men who do it, as well as the others who do other work, only by day. Our objections to not allowing boys under 18 to work at night would be on account of the increase of expense, but this is the only reason. What cynical naivete! We think that the increase would be more than the trade, with due regard to its being successfully carried out, could fairly bear. Labor is scarce here, and might fall short if there was such a regulation. In other words, Ellis or Brown and Company might be subjected to the fatal embarrassment of having to pay labor power at its full value. The Cyclops Deal in Ironworks of Messrs. Camel and Company is conducted on the same large scale as the works of the above-mentioned John Brown and Company. The managing director had handed in his evidence to the government commissioner, Mr. White, in writing. Later, he found it convenient to suppress the manuscript when it was returned to him for revision. But Mr. White has a retentive memory. He recalled quite clearly that for these Cyclopean gentlemen, the prohibition of the night labor of children and young persons, quote, would be impossible. It would be tantamount to stopping their works, end quote, and yet their business employs little more than 6% of boys under 18 and less than 1% under 13. On the same question, Mr. E. F. Sanderson, of the firm of Sanderson Brothers and Company, Steel Rolling Mills and Forges, Addercliffe, says, Great difficulty would be caused by preventing boys under 18 from working at night. The chief would be the increase of cost from employing men instead of boys. I cannot say what this would be, but probably it would not be enough to enable the manufacturers to raise the price of steel, and consequently it would fall on them, as of course the men, how wrong-headed these people are, would refuse to pay it. Mr. Sanderson does not know how much he pays the children, but, quote, perhaps the younger boys get from four shillings to five shillings a week. The boys' work is of a kind for which the strength of boys is generally, generally, but of course not always in particular, quite sufficient. And consequently, there would be no gain in the greater strength of the men to counterbalance the loss, or it would only be in the few cases in which the metal is heavy. The men would not like so well not to have boys under them, as men would be less obedient. Besides, boys must begin young to learn the trade. Leaving day work alone open to boys would not answer the purpose. And why not? Why could the boys not learn their craft in the daytime? Your reason? Owing to the men working days and nights in alternate week, the men would be separated half the time from the boys, and would lose half the profit which they make from them. The training which they give to an apprentice is considered as part of the return for the boys' labor, and thus enables the men to get it at a cheaper rate. Each man would want half of this profit. In other words, Messrs. Sanderson would have to pay part of the wages of the adult men out of their own pockets instead of by the night work of the boys. Messrs. Sanderson's profit would then fall to some extent, and this is the good Sandersonian reason why boys cannot learn their craft by day. Apart from this, it would throw night work on the men alone, who are at present relieved by the boys, and they would not be able to stand it. In short, the difficulties would be so great as to lead in all likelihood to the total suppression of night work. As far as the work itself is concerned, says E. F. Sanderson, this would suit us well, but, but Messrs. Sanderson have something else to make besides steel.
steel-making is simply a pretext for profit-making. The steel furnaces, rolling mills, etc., the buildings, machinery, iron, coal, etc., have something more to do than transform themselves into steel. They are there to absorb surplus labor, and they naturally absorb more in 24 hours than in 12. In fact, both by the sanction of the law and the grace of God, they give to the Sandersons a draft on the labor time of a certain number of hands for all the 24 hours of the day, and as soon as there is an interruption in their function of absorbing labor, they lose their character as capital, and are therefore a pure loss for the Sandersons. But then there would be the loss from so much expensive machinery, lying idle half the time, and to get through the amount of work which we are able to do on the present system, we should have to double our premieres and plant, which would double the outlay. But why should these Sandersons pretend to a privilege not enjoyed by the other capitalists, who only work during the day, and whose buildings, machinery, raw material therefore lie idle during the night? E.F. Sanderson answers in the name of all the Sandersons. It is true that there is this loss from machinery lying idle in those factories in which work only goes on by day, but the use of furnaces would involve a further loss in our case. If they were kept up, these would be a waste of fuel, instead of the present waste of the living substance of the workers, and if they were not, there would be a loss of time in laying the fires and getting the heat up, whereas a loss of sleeping time, even that of eight-year-olds, is a gain of working time for the Sanderson clan and the furnaces themselves would suffer from the changes of temperature, whereas those same furnaces suffer nothing from the alternation of day work and night work. Section 5. The Struggle for a Normal Working Day. Laws for the Compulsory Extension of the Working Day from the middle of the 14th to the end of the 17th century. What is a working day? What is the length of time during which capital may consume the labor power whose daily value it is paid for, how far may the working day be extended beyond the amount of labor time necessary for the reproduction of labor power itself? We have seen that Capital's reply to these questions is this. The working day contains the full 24 hours, with the deduction of the few hours of rest without which labor power is absolutely incapable of renewing its services. Hence it is self-evident that the worker is nothing other than labor power for the duration of his whole life, and that therefore all his disposable time is by nature and by right labor time, to be devoted to the self-valorization of capital. Time for education, for intellectual development, for the fulfillment of social functions, for social intercourse, for the free play of the vital forces of his body and his mind, even the rest time of Sunday, and that in a country of Sabbatarians. What foolishness! But in its blind and measureless drive, its insatiable appetite for surplus labor, capital oversteps not only the moral but even the merely physical limits of the working day. It usurps the time for growth, development, and healthy maintenance of the body. It steals the time required for the consumption of fresh air and sunlight. It haggles over the mealtimes, where possible, incorporating them into the production process itself, so that food is added to the worker as a mere means of production as coal is supplied to the boiler and grease and oil to the machinery. It reduces the sound sleep needed for the restoration, renewal, and refreshment of the vital forces to the exact amount of torpor essential to the revival of an absolutely exhausted organism. It is not the normal maintenance of labor power which determines the limits of the working day here, but rather the greatest possible daily expenditure of labor power, no matter how diseased, compulsory, and painful it may be, which determines the limits of the worker's period of rest. Capital asks no questions about the length of life of labor power. What interests it is purely and simply the maximum of labor power that can be set in motion in a working day. It attains this objective by shortening the life of labor power, in the same way as a greedy farmer snatches more produce from the soil by robbing it of its fertility. By extending the working day, therefore, capitalist production, which is essentially the production of surplus value, the absorption of surplus labor, not only produces a deterioration of human labor power, by robbing it of its normal moral and physical conditions of development and activity, but also produces the premature exhaustion and death of this labor power itself. It extends the worker's production time within a given period by shortening his life. But the value of labor power includes the value of the commodities necessary for the reproduction of the worker, for continuing the existence of the working class. If, then, the unnatural extension of the working day, which capital necessarily strives for in its unmeasured drive for self-valorization, shortens the life of the individual worker, and therefore the duration of his labor power, the forces used up have to be replaced more rapidly, and it'll be more expensive to reproduce labor power, just as in the case of a machine where part of its value that has to be reproduced daily grows greater 
the more rapidly the machine is worn out. It would seem, therefore, that the interest of capital itself points in the direction of a normal working day. The slave owner buys his worker in the same way as he buys his horse. If he loses his slave, he loses his capital, which he must replace by a fresh expenditure on the slave market. But take note of this. Quote, the rice grounds of Georgia or the swamps of Mississippi may be fatally injurious to the human constitution, but the waste of human life which the cultivation of these districts necessitates is not so great that it cannot be repaired from the teeming preserves of Virginia and Kentucky. Considerations of economy, moreover, which, under a natural system, afford some security for humane treatment by identifying the master's interest with the slave's preservation, when once trading in slaves is practiced, become reasons for racking to the uttermost the toil of the slave, for when his place can at once be supplied from foreign preserves, the duration of his life becomes a matter of less moment than its productiveness while it lasts. It is accordingly a maxim of slave management in slave-importing countries that the most effective economy is that which takes out of the human chattel in the shortest space of time the utmost amount of exertion it is capable of putting forth. It is in tropical culture, where annual profits often equal the whole capital of plantations, that Negro life is most recklessly sacrificed. It is the agriculture of the West Indies, which has been for centuries prolific of fabulous wealth that has engulfed millions of the African race. It is in Cuba at this day, whose revenues are reckoned by millions and whose planters are princes, that we see in the servile class the coarsest fare, the most exhausting and unremitting toil, and even the absolute destruction of a portion of its numbers every year. End quote from Cairns. Mutato nomine de te fabula narrator. The name is changed, but the tale is told of you. For slave trade, read Labor Market. For Kentucky and Virginia, Ireland and the agricultural districts of England, Scotland, and Wales. For Africa, Germany. We have heard how overwork has thinned the ranks of bakers in London. Nevertheless, the London labor market is always overstocked with German and other candidates for death in the bakeries. Pottery, as we saw, is one of the branches of industry with the lowest life expectancy. Does this lead to any shortage of potters? Josiah Wedgwood, the inventor of modern pottery, and himself an ordinary worker by origin, said in 1785 before the House of Commons that the whole trade employed from 15,000 to 20,000 people. In 1861, the population of the urban centers alone of this industry in Great Britain numbered 101,302. The cotton trade has existed for 90 years. It has existed for three generations of the English race, and I believe, I may safely say, that during that period, it has destroyed nine generations of factory operatives. End quote from Ferran's speech in the House of Commons, 27th of April, 1863. Admittedly, the labor market shows significant gaps in certain epochs of feverish expansion. In 1834, for example, but then the manufacturers proposed to the poor law commissioners that they should send the surplus population of the agricultural districts to the north, with the explanation, quote, that the manufacturers would absorb and use it up. Agents were appointed with the consent of the poor law commissioners. An office was set up in Manchester, to which lists were sent of those workpeople in the agricultural districts wanting employment, and their names were registered in books. The manufacturers attended at these offices and selected such persons as they chose. When they had selected such persons as their wants required, they gave instructions to have them forwarded to Manchester, and they were sent, ticketed like bales of goods, by canals or with carriers, others tramping on the road, and many of them were found on the way lost and half-starved. This system had grown up into a regular trade. This house will hardly believe it, but I tell them that this traffic in human flesh was as well kept up. They were in effect as regularly sold to these manufacturers as slaves are sold to the cotton grower in the United States. In 1860, the cotton trade was at its zenith. The manufacturers again found they were short of hands. They applied to the flesh agents, as they are called. Those agents sent to the southern downs of England, to the pastures of Dorsetshire, to the glades of Devonshire, to the people tending kine in Wiltshire, but they sought in vain. The surplus population was absorbed. The Berry Guardian lamented that, after the conclusion of the Anglo-French Commercial Treaty, 10,000 additional hands could be absorbed by Lancashire, and that 30,000 or 40,000 will be needed. After the flesh agents and sub-agents had vainly combed through the agricultural districts, a deputation came up to London and waited on the right honorable gentleman Mr. Villiers, president of the Poor Law Board, with the view of obtaining poor children from certain union houses for the mills of Lancashire. What experience generally shows to the capitalist is a constant excess of population i.e. an excess in relation to capital's need for valorization at a given moment, 
although this throng of people is made up of generations of stunted, short-lived, and rapidly replaced human beings, plucked, so to speak, before they were ripe. And indeed, experience shows to the intelligent observer how rapidly and firmly capitalist production has seized the vital forces of the people at their very roots, although historically speaking, it hardly dates from yesterday. Experience shows, too, how the degeneration of the industrial population is retarded only by the constant absorption of primitive and natural elements from the countryside, and how even the agricultural labors, in spite of the fresh air and principle of natural selection that works so powerfully amongst them and permits the survival of only the strongest individuals, are already beginning to die off. Capital, which has such good reasons for denying the sufferings of the legions of workers surrounding it, allows its actual movement to be determined as much and as little by the right of the coming degradation and final depopulation of the human race as by the probable fall of the earth into the sun. In every stock-jobbing swindle, everyone knows that some time or other the crash must come, but everyone hopes that it may fall on the head of his neighbor after he himself has caught the shower of gold and placed it in secure hands. Après moi, le déluge is the watchword of every capitalist and of every capitalist nation. Capital, therefore, takes no account of the health and the length of life of the worker unless society forces it to do so. Its answer to the outcry about the physical and mental degradation, the premature death, the torture of overwork, is this. Should that pain trouble us, since it increases our pleasure, being profit? But looking at these things as a whole, it is evident that this does not depend on the will, either good or bad, of the individual capitalist. Under free competition, the imminent laws of capitalist production confront the individual capitalist as a coercive force external to him. The establishment of a normal working day is the result of centuries of struggle between the capitalist and the worker. But the history of this struggle displays two opposite tendencies. Compare, for example, the English factory legislation of our time with the English labor statutes from the 14th century to well in the middle of the 18th. While the modern factory acts compulsorily shorten the working day, the earlier statutes tried forcibly to lengthen it. Of course, the pretensions of capital in its embryonic state, in its state of becoming when it cannot as yet use the sheer force of economic relations to secure its right to absorb a sufficient quantity of surplus labor, but must be aided by the power of the state, its pretensions in this situation appear very modest in comparison with the concessions it has to make, complainingly and unwillingly, in its adult condition. Centuries are required before the free worker, owing to the greater development of the capitalist mode of production, makes a voluntary agreement, i.e. is compelled by social conditions, to sell the whole of his active life, his very capacity for labor, in return for the price of his customary means of subsistence, to sell his birthright for a mess of pottage. Hence it is natural that the longer working day which capital tried to impose on adult workers by acts of state power from the middle of the 14th to the end of the 17th century is approximately of the same length as the shorter working day which, in the second half of the 19th century, the state has here and there interposed as a barrier to the transformation of children's blood into capital. What has now been proclaimed, for instance in the state of Massachusetts, until recently the freest state of the North American Republic, as the statutory limit for the labor of children under 12, was in England, even in the middle of the 17th century, the normal working day of able-bodied artisans, robust plowmen, and gigantic blacksmiths. The first statute of laborers found its immediate pretext, not its cause, for legislation of this kind outlives its pretext by centuries, in the great plague that decimated the population, so that, as a Tory writer says, quote, the difficulty of getting men to work on reasonable terms, i.e. at a price that left their employers a reasonable quantity of surplus labor, grew to such a height as to be quite intolerable. Reasonable wages were therefore fixed by law as well as the limits of the working day. The latter point, the only one that interests us here, is repeated in the statute of 1496 under Henry VII. The working day for all craftsmen, artificers and field laborers from March to September was supposed to last from five in the morning to between seven and eight in the evening, although this was never enforced. The meal times, however, consisted of one hour for breakfast, one and a half hours for dinner, and half an hour for noon meat, i.e. exactly twice as much as under the factory acts now in force. In winter, work was to last from five in the morning until dark, with the same intervals. A statute of Elizabeth of 1562 leaves the length of the working day for all laborers hired for daily or weekly wages untouched, but seeks to limit the intervals to two and a half hours in the summer and two in the winter. Dinner is to last only one hour, and the 
Afternoon sleep of half an hour is only allowed between the middle of May and the middle of August. For every hour of absence, one pence is to be subtracted from the wage. In practice, however, the conditions were much more favorable to the laborers than in the statute book. William Petty, the father of political economy, and to some extent the founder of statistics, says in a work he published in the last third of the 17th century, quote, Laboring men, the meaning then was agricultural laborers, work ten hours per diem, and make twenty meals per week, three a day for working days, and two on Sundays, whereby it is plain that if they could fast on Friday nights, and dine in one hour and a half, whereas they take two from eleven to one, thereby thus working one twentieth more, and spending one twentieth less, the above-mentioned tax might be raised. Was Dr. Andrew Urey not right when he deplored the Twelve Hours Bill of 1833 as a retrogression to the Age of Darkness? It is true that the regulations contained in the statutes, and mentioned by Petty, apply also to apprentices. But the situation with respect to child labor, even at the end of the 17th century, is shown by the following complaint. Our youth, here in England, do absolutely nothing before they come to be apprentices, and then they naturally require a long time, seven years, to be formed into complete craftsmen. Germany, on the other hand, is praised because the children there are educated from their cradle at least to something of employment. Still, during the greater part of the 18th century, up to the epoch of large-scale industry, capital in England had not succeeded in gaining control of the worker's whole week by paying the weekly value of his labor power. The agricultural labors, however, formed an exception. The fact that they could live for a whole week on the wage of four days did not appear to the workers to be a sufficient reason for working for the capitalists for the other two days. One party of English economists, in the service of capital, denounced this obstinacy in the most violent manner. Another party defended the workers. Let us listen, for example, to the polemic between Postlethwaite, whose Dictionary of Trade then enjoyed the same reputation as similar works by McCulloch and McGregor do today, and the author of the Essay on Trade and Commerce cited earlier. Postlethwaite says, among other things, quote, We cannot put an end to these few observations without noticing that trite remark in the mouth of too many, that if the industrious poor can obtain enough to maintain themselves in five days, they will not work the whole six. Whence they infer the necessity of even the necessaries of life being made dear by taxes, or by any other means, to compel the working artisan and manufacturer to labor the whole six days in the week without ceasing. I must beg leave to differ in sentiment from those great politicians who contend for the perpetual slavery of the working people of this kingdom. They forget the vulgar adage, all work and no play. Have not the English boasted of the ingenuity and dexterity of her working artists and manufacturers which have heretofore given credit and reputation to British wares in general? What has this been owing to? To nothing more, probably, than the relaxation of the working people in their own way. Were they obliged to toil the year round, the whole six days in the week, in a repetition of the same work, might it not blunt their ingenuity and render them stupid instead of alert and dexterous, and might not our workmen lose their reputation instead of maintaining it by such eternal slavery? And what sort of workmanship could we expect from such hard-driven animals? Many of them will execute as much work in four days as a Frenchman will in five or six, but if Englishmen are to be eternal drudges, it is to be feared that they will degenerate below the Frenchman. As our people are famed for bravery in war, do we not say that it is owing to good English roast beef and pudding in their bellies, as well as their constitutional spirit of liberty? And why may not the superior ingenuity and dexterity of our artists and manufacturers be owing to that freedom and liberty to direct themselves in their own way? And I hope we shall never have them deprived of such privileges and that good living from whence their ingenuity no less than their courage may proceed. To this, the author of the Essay on Trade and Commerce replies, quote, if the making of every seventh day an holiday is supposed to be of divine institution, as it implies the appropriating the other six days to labor, he means capital, as we shall soon see, surely it will not be thought cruel to enforce it. That mankind in general are naturally inclined to ease and indolence, we fatally experience to be true, from the conduct of our manufacturing populace who do not labor, upon an average, above four days in a week, unless provisions happen to be very dear." Put all the necessaries of the poor under one denomination, for instance, call them all wheat, or suppose that the bushel of wheat shall cost five shillings, and that he, the worker, earns a shilling a day by his labor. He then would be obliged to work five days only in a week. If the bushel of wheat should cost but four shillings, he would be obliged to work but four days. But as wages in this kingdom are much higher in proportion to the price of necessaries, the manufacturer, i.e. the manufacturing worker, who labors four days has a surplus of money to live idle with for the rest of the week. 
I hope I have said enough to make it appear that the moderate labor of six days in a week is no slavery. Our laboring people, i.e. the agricultural laborers, do this, and to all appearances are the happiest of our laboring poor. But the Dutch do this in manufactures and appear to be a very happy people. The French do so when holidays do not intervene. But our populace have adopted a notion that as Englishmen they enjoy a birthright privilege of being more free and independent than in any country in Europe. Now this idea, as far as it may affect the bravery of our troops, may be of some use. But the less the manufacturing poor have of it, certainly the better for themselves and for the state. The laboring people should never think themselves independent of their superiors. It is extremely dangerous to encourage mobs in a commercial state like ours, where perhaps seven parts out of eight of the whole are people with little or no property. The cure will not be perfect till our manufacturing poor are contented to labor six days for the same sum which they now earn in four days. End quote. To this end, and for extirpating idleness, debauchery, and excess, promoting a spirit of industry, lowering the price of labor in our manufactories, and easing the lands of the heavy burden of the poor's rates, our faithful Eckhart of Capital proposes the well-tried method of locking up workers who become dependent on public support, in one word, paupers, in an ideal workhouse. Such an ideal workhouse must be made a house of terror, and not an asylum for the poor, quote, where they are to be plentifully fed, warmly and decently clothed, and where they do but little work. In this house of terror, the ideal workhouse, quote, the poor shall work fourteen hours in a day, allowing proper time for meals in such a manner that there shall remain twelve hours of neat labor. Twelve working hours in a day like the ideal workhouse, the house of terror of 1770. Sixty-three years later, in 1833, when the English Parliament reduced the working day for children of thirteen to eighteen years to twelve full hours in four branches of industry, the day of judgment seemed to have dawned for English industry. In 1852, when Louis Bonaparte sought to secure his position with the bourgeoisie by tampering with the legal working day, the people of France cried out with one voice, The law that limits the working day to twelve hours is the one good that has remained to us of the legislation of the Republic. At Zurich, the work of children over ten is limited to twelve hours. In Argonne, 1862, the work of children between thirteen and sixteen was reduced from twelve and a half to twelve hours. In Austria, in 1860, for children between fourteen and sixteen, the same reduction was made. What progress since 1770, Macaulay might shout with exultation. The house of terror for paupers, only dreamed of by the capitalist mind in 1770, was brought into being a few years later, in the shape of a gigantic workhouse for the industrial worker himself. It was called the factory. And this time, the ideal was a pale shadow compared with the reality. Section 6. The Struggle for a Normal Working Day. Laws for the Compulsory Limitation of Working Hours. The English Factory Legislation of 1833-64 After capital had taken centuries to extend the working day to its normal maximum limit, and then beyond this to the limit of the natural day of twelve hours, there followed, with the birth of large-scale industry in the last third of the eighteenth century, an avalanche of violent and unmeasured encroachments. Every boundary set by morality and nature, age and sex, day and night, was broken down. Even the ideas of day and night, which in the old statutes were of pleasant simplicity, became so confused that an English judge as late as 1860 needed the penetration of an interpreter of the Talmud to explain judicially what was day and what was night. Capital was celebrating its orgies. As soon as the working class, stunned at first by the noise and turmoil of the new system of production, had recovered its senses to some extent, it began to offer resistance, first of all in England, the native land of large-scale industry. For three decades, however, the concessions wrung from industry by the working class remained purely nominal. Parliament passed five labor laws between 1802 and 1833, but was shrewd enough not to vote a penny for their compulsory implementation, for the necessary official personnel, etc. They remained a dead letter. Quote, the fact is that prior to the Act of 1833, young persons and children were worked all night, all day, or both at libitum. End quote from the reports of the Inspectors of Factories, published the 30th of April, 1860. A normal working day for modern industry dates only from the Factory Act of 1833, which included cotton, wool, flax, and silk factories. 
Nothing characterizes the spirit of capital better than the history of the English factory legislation from 1833 to 1864. The Act of 1833 lays down that the ordinary factory working day should begin at 5.30 in the morning and end at 8.30 in the evening, and within these limits, a period of 15 hours, it is lawful to employ young persons, i.e. persons between 13 and 18 years of age, at any time of the day, provided that no one individual young person works more than 12 hours in any one day, except in certain cases especially provided for. The sixth chapter of the Act provided, quote, that there shall be allowed, in the course of every day, not less than one and a half hours for meals to every such person restricted as here and before provided. The employment of children under nine, with exceptions mentioned later, was forbidden. The work of children between nine and thirteen was limited to eight hours a day. Night work, i.e. according to this act, work between 8.30 p.m. and 5.30 a.m., was forbidden for all persons between nine and eighteen. The lawmakers were so far from wishing to interfere with the freedom of capital to exploit adult labor power, or as they called it, the freedom of labor, that they created a special system in order to prevent the factory acts from having such a frightful consequence. Quote, the great evil of the factory system, as at present conducted, says the first report at the Central Board of the Commission on the 28th of June, 1833, has appeared to us to be that it entails the necessity of continuing the labor of children to the utmost length of that of the adults, the only remedy for this evil, short of the limitation of the labor of adults, which would, in our opinion, create an evil greater than that which is sought to be remedied, appears to be the plan of working double sets of children. Under the name of the system of relays, relay means in English, as also in French, the changing of the post horses at each different halting place. This plan was therefore carried out, so that, for example, one set of children of between 9 and 13 years were put into harness from 5.30 a.m. until 1.30 p.m., another set from 1.30 p.m. until 8.30 p.m., and so on. In order to reward the manufacturers for having, in the most impudent way, ignored all the acts relating to child labor past dating the previous 22 years, the pill was yet further gilded for them. Parliament decreed that after the 1st of March 1834, no child under 11, after the 1st of March 1835, no child under 12, and after the 1st of March 1836, no child under 13 was to work more than eight hours in a factory. This liberalism, so full of consideration for capital, was the more noteworthy in that Dr. Farr, Sir A. Carlyle, Sir B. Brodie, Sir C. Bell, Mr. Guthrie, etc., in a word, the most distinguished physicians and surgeons in London, had declared in their evidence before the House of Commons that there was danger in delay. Dr. Farr was still blunter, quote, Legislation is necessary for the prevention of death in any form in which it can be prematurely inflicted, and certainly this, the factory method, must be viewed as a most cruel mode of inflicting it. The same reformed parliament, which in its delicate consideration for the manufacturers condemned children under 13 for years to come to the hell of 72 hours of factory labor every week, this same parliament, in the Emancipation Act, which also administered freedom drop by drop, forbade the planters, from the very beginning, to work any Negro slave for more than 45 hours a week. But capital was by no means soothed. It now began a noisy and long-lasting agitation. This turned on the age limit of the category of human beings who, under the name children, were restricted to eight hours of work and were subject to a certain amount of compulsory education. According to the anthropology of the capitalists, the age of childhood ended at ten, or at the outside, eleven. The nearer the deadline approached for the full implementation of the Factory Act, the fatal year 1836, the wilder became the rage of the mob of manufacturers. They managed, in fact, to intimidate the government to such an extent that in 1835 it proposed to lower the limit of the age of childhood from 13 to 12. But now the pressure from without became more threatening. The House of Commons lost its nerve. It refused to throw children of 13 under the juggernaut wheels of capital for more than eight hours a day, and the Act of 1833 came into full operation. It remained unaltered until June of 1844. During the decade in which it regulated factory work, at first in part and then entirely, the official reports of the factory inspectors teem with complaints about the impossibility of enforcing it. The point of time within the 15 hours from 5.30 a.m. to 8.30 p.m. at which each young person and each child was to begin, break off, resume, or end his 12 or 8 hours labor was left by the Act of 1833 to the free decision of the Lords of Capital. Similarly, the Act also permitted them to assign different meal times to different persons, 
Thanks to this provision, the capitalists soon discovered a new system of relays, by which the workhorses were not changed at fixed stations, but were always re-harnessed at different stations. We shall not pause here to reflect on the beauty of this system, as we shall have to return to it later. But this much is clear at first glance. It annulled the whole Factory Act, not only in the spirit, but in the letter. How could the factory inspectors, with this complex bookkeeping in respect of each individual child or young person, enforce the legally determined hours of work and compel the employers to grant the legal mealtimes? In many of the factories, the old and scandalous brutality soon blossomed again unpunished. In an interview with the Home Secretary, 1844, the factory inspectors demonstrated the impossibility of any control under the newly invented relay system. In the meantime, however, circumstances had greatly changed. The factory workers, especially since 1838, had made the Ten Hours Bill their economic, as they had made the Charter their political, election cry. Some of the manufacturers even, who had run their factories in conformity with the Act of 1833, overwhelmed Parliament with representations on the immoral competition of their false brethren, who were able to break the law because of their greater impudence or their more fortunate local circumstances. Moreover, however much the individual manufacturer might like to give free rein to his old lust for gain, the spokesmen and political leaders of the manufacturing class ordered a change in attitude and in language towards the workers. They had started their campaign to repeal the Corn Laws, and they needed the workers to help them to victory. They promised, therefore, not only that the loaf of bread would be twice its size, but also that the Ten Hours Bill would be enacted in the free trade millennium. Thus, they were even less inclined, and less able, to oppose a measure intended only to make the Law of 1833 a reality. And finally, the Tories, threatened in their most sacred interest, the rent of land, thundered with philanthropic indignation against the nefarious practices of their foes. This was the origin of the Additional Factory Act of the 7th of June, 1844, which came into effect on the 10th of September, 1844. It placed under protection a new category of workers, namely women over 18. They were placed in every respect on the same footing as young persons, their working hours limited to twelve, and night work forbidden to them. For the first time, it was found necessary for the labor of adults to be controlled directly and officially by legislation. The Factory Report of 1844-45 to states ironically, No instances have come to my knowledge of adult women having expressed any regret at their rights being thus far interfered with. The working hours of children under thirteen were reduced to six and a half, and in certain circumstances to seven. To get rid of the abuses of the spurious system of relays, the law established, among other things, the following important regulations. Quote, the hours of work of children and young persons shall be reckoned from the time when any child or young person shall begin to work in the morning, so that if A, for example, begins work at 8 in the morning and B at 10, B's working day must nevertheless end at the same hour as A's. The time shall be regulated by a public clock, for example, the nearest railway clock, by which the factory clock is to be set. The manufacturer has to hang up a legible, printed notice stating the hours for the beginning and ending of the work and the pauses allowed for meals. Children beginning work before 12 noon may not be again employed after 1 p.m. The afternoon shift must therefore consist of other children than those employed in the morning. Of the hour and a half for meal times, quote, one hour thereof at the least shall be given before three of the clock in the afternoon and at the same period of the day. No child or young person shall be employed more than five hours before 1 p.m. without an interval for mealtime of at least 30 minutes. No child or young person, or female, shall be employed or allowed to remain in any room in which any manufacturing process is then, i.e. at mealtimes, carried on. It has been seen that these highly detailed specifications, which regulate with military uniformity the times, the limits, and the pauses of work by the stroke of the clock, were by no means a product of the fantasy of members of Parliament, they developed gradually, out of the circumstances as natural laws of the modern mode of production. Their formulation, official recognition, and proclamation by the state were the result of a long class struggle. One of their first consequences was that in practice, the working day of adult males in factories became subject to the same limitations, since in most processes of production the cooperation of children, young persons, and women is indispensable. On the whole, therefore, during the period from 1844 to 47, the 12 hours working day became universal and uniform in all branches of industry under the Factory Act. The manufacturers, however, did not allow this progress without a compensating retrogression. At their instigation, the House of Commons reduced the minimum age for exploitable children from 9 to 8 in order to ensure that, quote, additional supply of factory children, end quote, which is owed to the capitalists. <laughs> 
according to divine and human law. The years 1846-47 to are epoch-making in the economic history of England. The Corn Laws were repealed, the duties on cotton and other raw materials were removed, free trade was proclaimed as the guiding star of legislation, in short, the millennium had arrived. On the other hand, in the same years the Chartist movement and the Ten Hours Agitation reached their highest point, they found allies in the Tories, who were panting for revenge. Despite the fanatical opposition of the army of perjured free traders, headed by Bright and Cobden, the Ten Hours Bill, so long struggled for, made its way through Parliament. The new Factory Act of the 8th of June 1847 enacted that on the 1st of July 1847 there should be a preliminary reduction of the working day for young persons, from 13 to 18, and all females to 11 hours, but that on the 1st of May 1848 there should be a definite limitation of the working day to 10 hours. For the rest, the Act was only an amendatory supplement to the Acts of 1833 and 1844. Capital now undertook a preliminary campaign to prevent the Act from coming into full force on the 1st of May 1848, and the workers themselves, under the pretense that they had been taught by experience, were to help in the destruction of their own work. The moment was cleverly chosen. Quote, it must be remembered, too, that there has been more than two years of great suffering, in consequence of the terrible crisis of 1846-7, among the factory operatives, from many mills having worked short time, and many being altogether closed. A considerable number of the operatives must therefore be in very narrow circumstances, many, it is to be feared, in debt, so that it might fairly have been presumed that at the present time they would prefer working the longer time, in order to make up for past losses, perhaps to pay off debts, or get their furniture out of pawn, or replace that sold, or to get a new supply of clothes for themselves and their families." End quote from Reports of the Inspectors of Factories, published on the 31st of October, 1848. The manufacturers tried to aggravate the natural impact of these circumstances by a general 10% reduction in wages. This was done in order, as it were, to celebrate the inauguration of the new free trade era. Then followed a further reduction of 8 and one third percent as soon as the working day was shortened to 11 hours, and a reduction of twice that amount as soon as it was finally shortened to 10. Therefore, whenever circumstances permitted, a reduction in wages of at least 25% took place. Under these favorably prepared conditions, the agitation among the factory workers for the repeal of the Act of 1847 was begun. No method of deceit, seduction, or intimidation was left unused, but all in vain. In relation to the half-dozen petitions in which the workers were made to complain of their oppression by the Act, the petitioners themselves declared under oral examination that their signatures had been extorted. They felt themselves oppressed, but by something different than the Factory Act. But if the manufacturers did not succeed in getting the workers to speak as they wished, they themselves shrieked all the louder in the press and in Parliament in the name of the workers. They denounced the factory inspector as a species of revolutionary commissioner reminiscent of the convention, who would ruthlessly sacrifice the unfortunate factory workers to his mania for improving the world. This maneuver also failed. Leonard Horner, himself a factory inspector, conducted many examinations of witnesses in the factories of Lancashire, both personally and through sub-inspectors. About 70% of the workers examined declared in favor of 10 hours, a much smaller percentage in favor of 11, and an altogether insignificant minority for the old 12 hours. Another friendly dodge was to make the adult males work 12 to 15 hours, and then to declare that this fact was a fine demonstration of what the proletariat really wanted. But the ruthless factory inspector Leonard Horner was again on the spot. The majority of the overtimers declared, quote, They would much prefer working ten hours for less wages, but they had no choice. So many were out of employment, so many spinners getting very low wages by having to work as piecers being unable to do better, that if they refused to work the longer time, others would immediately get their places, so that it was a question with them of agreeing to work the longer time or of being thrown out of employment altogether. The preliminary campaign of capital thus came to grief, and the Ten Hours Act came into force on the 1st of May, 1848. Meanwhile, however, the fiasco of the Chartist Party, whose leaders had been imprisoned and whose organization dismembered, had shattered the self-confidence of the English working class. Soon after this, the June insurrection in Paris and its bloody suppression united, in England as on the continent, all fractions of the ruling classes, landowners and capitalists, stock exchange sharks and small-time shopkeepers, protectionists and free traders, government and opposition, priests and free thinkers, young whores and old nuns, under the common slogan of the salvation of property, religion, the family, and society. Everywhere the working class was outlawed, 
The manufacturers no longer needed to restrain themselves. They broke out in open revolt, not only against the Ten Hours Act, but against all the legislation since 1833 that aimed at restricting, to some extent, the free exploitation of labor power. It was a pro-slavery rebellion in miniature, carried on for over two years with a cynical recklessness and a terroristic energy which were so much the easier to achieve in that the rebel capitalist risked nothing but the skin of his workers. To understand what follows, we must remember that all three factory acts, those of 1833, 1844, and 1847, were in force insofar as the one did not amend the others, that not one of these limited the working day of the male worker over 18, and that since 1833, the 15 hours from 5.30 a.m. until 8.30 p.m. had remained the legal day, within the limits of which the 12 hours and later the 10 hours of labor by young persons and women had to be performed under the prescribed conditions. The manufacturers began by here and there dismissing a number of the young persons and women they employed, in many cases half of them, and then, for the adult males, restoring night work, which had almost disappeared. The Ten Hours Act, they cried, leaves us no other alternative. The second step they took related to the legal pauses for meals. Let us listen to the factory inspectors. Since the restriction of the hours of work to ten, the factory occupiers maintain, although they have not yet practically gone the whole length, that supposing the hours of work to be from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m., they fulfill the provision of the statutes by allowing an hour before 9 a.m. and half an hour after 7 p.m. In some cases, they now allow an hour, or half an hour for dinner, insisting at the same time that they are not bound to allow any part of the hour and a half in the course of the factory working day. Thus the manufacturers maintain that these scrupulously strict provisions of the Act of 1844 with regard to meal times only gave the workers permission to eat and drink before coming into the factory and after leaving it, i.e. at home. And why indeed should the workers not eat their dinner before nine o'clock in the morning? The Crown lawyers, however, decided that the prescribed meal times, quote, must be in the interval during the working hours, and that it will not be lawful to work for ten hours continuously from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. without any interval. After these pleasant demonstrations, Capital commenced its real revolt by taking a step which agreed with the letter of the law in 1844, and was therefore legal. The Act of 1844 certainly prohibited the employment after 1 p.m. of children aged from 8 to 13 who had been employed before noon, but it did not regulate in any way the six and a half hours' work of the children whose working day began at twelve midday or later. Children of eight might, if they began work at noon, be employed from twelve till one, from two till four, and from five till eight-thirty in the evening. Taken together, this made up a legal six and a half hours. But they could do even better. In order to make the children's work coincide with that of the adult male laborers up to 8.30 p.m., the manufacturers only had to give them no work till 2 in the afternoon. They could then keep them in the factory until 8.30 in the evening without intermission. Quote, And it is now expressly admitted that the practice exists in England from the desire of mill owners to have their machinery at work for more than 10 hours a day to keep the children at work with male adults after all the young persons and women have left and until 8.30 p.m., if the factory owners choose. Workers and factory inspectors protested on hygienic and moral grounds, but Capital answered, My deeds upon my head, I crave the law, the penalty and forfeit of my bond. In fact, according to statistics laid before the House of Commons on the 26th of July, 1850, 3,742 children were still being subjected to this practice in 257 factories on the 15th of July, 1850, despite all the protests. But this was not enough. Lynx-eyed Capital discovered that although the Act of 1844 did not allow five hours' work before midday without a pause of at least 30 minutes for refreshment, it prescribed nothing like this for afternoon work. Hence Capital demanded and maintained the satisfaction not only of making children of eight drudge without any interval from 2 to 8.30 p.m., but also of letting them go hungry. I his breast, so says the bond. This Shylock-like clinging to the letter of the law in 1844, insofar as it regulated child labor, was, however, only a way of introducing an open revolt against the same law, insofar as it regulated the labor of young persons and women. It'll be remembered that the abolition of the false relay system was the main aim of that law, and formed its main content. The manufacturers began their revolt simply by declaring that the sections of the Act of 1844 which prohibited the unrestricted use of young persons and women in such short fractions of the day of fifteen hours as the employer chose, had been 
comparatively harmless as long as the working hours were limited to 12 hours, but that under the 10 Hours Act they were a grievous hardship. They informed the inspectors very coolly that they would set themselves above the letter of the law and reintroduce the old system on their own account. This would, they said, be in the interest of the ill-advised operatives themselves, as it would allow them to pay higher wages. This was the only possible plan by which to maintain, under the Ten Hours Act, the industrial supremacy of Great Britain. Perhaps it may be a little difficult to detect irregularities under the relay system, but what of that? Is the great manufacturing interest of this country to be treated as a secondary matter in order to save some little trouble to inspectors and sub-inspectors of factories? All these dodges were, of course, to no avail. The factory inspectors appealed to the courts. But the Home Secretary, Sir George Grey, was soon so overwhelmed by the clouds of dust arising from the manufacturers' petitions that in a circular of the 5th of August, 1848, he recommended the inspectors not to lay informations against the mill owners for a breach of the letter of the Act or for the employment of young persons by relays in cases in which there is no reason to believe that such young persons have been actually employed for a longer period than that sanctioned by law. At this, factory inspector J. Stewart allowed the so-called relay system for the 15-hour period of the factory day to be restored throughout Scotland, where it soon flourished again as of old. The English factory inspectors, on the other hand, declared that the Home Secretary had no dictatorial powers enabling him to suspend the laws and continued their legal proceedings against the pro-slavery rebellion. But what was the point of summoning the manufacturers to appear before the courts when the courts, in this case the county magistrates, acquitted them? In these tribunals, the manufacturers sat in judgment on themselves. An example, a certain Eskridge, a cotton spinner of the firm of Kershaw, Lease & Company, had laid before the factory inspector of his district the details of a relay system intended for his mill. Receiving a refusal, he at first kept quiet. A few months later, an individual named Robinson, also a cotton spinner, and if not Eskridge's man Friday, at least his relative, appeared before the borough magistrates of Stockport on a charge of introducing the very plan of relays Eskridge had devised. The bench consisted of four justices, three of them cotton spinners, and was headed by this same inevitable Eskridge. Eskridge acquitted Robinson, and now decided that what was right for Robinson was fair for Eskridge. Supported by his own legal decision, he at once introduced the new relay system into his own factory. Of course, the composition of this tribunal was in itself a blatant violation of the law. These judicial farces, exclaims Inspector Howell, urgently call for a remedy, either that the law should be so altered as to be made to conform to these decisions, or that it should be administered by a less fallible tribunal, whose decisions would conform to the law when these cases are brought forward. I long for a stipendiary magistrate. The Crown lawyers declared that the manufacturer's interpretation of the Act of 1848 was absurd, but the saviors of society would not allow themselves to be turned from their purpose. Leonard Horner reports, Having endeavored to enforce the Act by ten prosecutions in seven magisterial divisions, and having been supported by the magistrates in one case only, I considered it useless to prosecute more for this evasion of the law. That part of the Act of 1848, which was framed for securing uniformity in the hours of work, is thus no longer in force in my district of Lancashire. Neither have the sub-inspectors nor myself any means of satisfying ourselves when we inspect a mill working by shifts that the young persons and women are not working more than ten hours a day. In a return of the 30th of April of mill owners working by shifts, the number amounts to 114, and has been for some time rapidly increasing. In general, the time of working the mill is extended to 13 and a half hours, from 6 a.m. to 7 and a half p.m. In some instances, it amounts to 15 hours, from 5 and a half a.m. to 8 and a half p.m. Leonard Horner already possessed by December 1848 a list of 65 manufacturers and 29 factory overseers who unanimously declared that no system of supervision could, under this relay system, prevent the most extensive amount of overwork. Sometimes the same children and young persons were shifted from the spinning room to the weaving room. Sometimes, in the course of fifteen hours, they were shifted from one factory to another. How is it possible to control a system which, under the guise of relays, is some one of the many plans for shuffling the hands about in endless variety and shifting the hours of work and of rest for different individuals throughout the day so that you may never have one complete set of hands working together in the same room at the same time? 
But even if we entirely leave aside actual overwork, this so-called relay system was an offspring of Capital's imagination never surpassed even by Fourier in his humorous sketches of these short sessions, except that the attraction of labor is here transformed into the attraction of capital. Look, for example, at those schemes praised by the respectable press as models of what a reasonable degree of care and method can accomplish. The working personnel was sometimes divided into from 12 to 15 categories, and these categories themselves constantly underwent changes in their composition. During the 15 hours of the factory day, Capital dragged in the worker now for 30 minutes, now for an hour, and then pushed him out again to drag him into the factory and thrust him out afresh, hounding him hither and thither, in scattered shreds of time, without ever letting go until the full ten hours of work was done. As on the stage, the same persons had to appear in turn in the different scenes of the different acts. And just as an actor is committed to the stage throughout the whole course of the play, so the workers were committed to the factory for the whole fifteen hours, without reckoning the time taken in coming and going. Thus the hours of rest were turned into hours of enforced idleness, which drove the young men to the taverns and the young girls to the brothels. Every new trick the capitalist hit upon from day to day for keeping his machinery going for 12 or 15 hours without increasing the number of the personnel meant that the worker had to gulp down his meals in different fragments of time. During the 10 hours agitation, the manufacturers cried out that the mob of workers were petitioning in the hope of obtaining 12 hours wages for 10 hours work. Now they reversed the medal. They paid 10 hours wages for 12 or 15 hours disposition over the workers' labor power. This was the heart of the matter. This was the manufacturer's edition of the 10 hours law. These were the same unctuous free traders dripping with the milk of human kindness who for 10 whole years during the agitation against the corn laws had demonstrated to the workers by making precise calculations in pounds, shillings, and pence that with corn freely imported, 10 hours of labor would be quite sufficient given the existing means of English industry to enrich the capitalists. This revolt of capital was after two years finally crowned with victory by a decision handed down by one of the four highest courts in England, the Court of Exchequer, which, in a case brought before it on the 8th of February, 1850, decided that the manufacturers were certainly acting against the sense of the Act of 1844, but that this Act itself contained certain words that rendered it meaningless. This verdict was tantamount to an abrogation of the Ten Hours Bill. A great number of manufacturers, who until then had been afraid to use the shift system for young persons and women, now seized on it enthusiastically. But this apparently decisive victory of capital was immediately followed by a counterstroke. So far, the workers had offered a resistance which was passive, though inflexible and unceasing. They now protested in Lancashire and Yorkshire in threatening meetings. The so-called Ten Hours Act, they said, was thus mere humbug, a parliamentary fraud. It had never existed. The factory inspectors urgently warned the government that class antagonisms had reached an unheard-of degree of tension. Some of the manufacturers themselves grumbled, On account of the contradictory decisions of the magistrates, a condition of things altogether abnormal and anarchical obtains. One law holds in Yorkshire, another in Lancashire, one law in one parish of Lancashire, another in its immediate neighborhood. The manufacturer in large towns could evade the law, but the manufacturer in country districts could not find the people necessary for the relay system, still less for the shifting of hands from one factory to another, etc. And the most fundamental right, under the law of capital, is the equal exploitation of labor power by all capitalists. Under these circumstances, it came to a compromise between manufacturers and men, given the seal of parliamentary approval in the Supplementary Factory Act of the 5th of August, 1850. The working day for young persons and women was lengthened from ten to ten and a half hours for the first five days of the week and shortened to seven and a half hours on Saturdays. The work had to take place between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m., with pauses of not less than one and a half hours for mealtimes, these mealtimes to be allowed at exactly the same time for all and in accordance with the regulations laid down in 1844. By this, the relay system was ended once and for all. For child labor, the Act of 1844 remained in force. One set of manufacturers secured to themselves special seigneurial rights over the children of the proletariat, just as they had done before. These were the silk manufacturers. In 1833, they had howled threateningly that if the liberty of working children of any age for ten hours a day were taken away, it would stop their works. In 
it would be impossible for them to buy a sufficient number of children over 13. They extorted the privilege they desired. Subsequent investigations show that the pretext was a deliberate lie. This did not, however, prevent them, throughout the following decade, from spinning silk for ten hours a day out of the blood of little children who had to be put on stools to perform their work. The Act of 1844 certainly robbed the silk manufacturers of the liberty of employing children under eleven for longer than six and a half hours each day. But as against this, it secured them the privilege of working children between eleven and thirteen for ten hours a day, and annulling, in their case, the education which had been made compulsory for all other factory children. This time the pretext was the delicate texture of the fabric in which they were employed, requiring a lightness of touch only to be acquired by their early introduction to these factories. The children were quite simply slaughtered for the sake of their delicate fingers, just as horned cattle are slaughtered in southern Russia for their hides and their fat. Finally, in 1850, the privilege granted in 1844 was limited to the departments of silk twisting and silk winding. But here, in order to compensate capital for the loss of its liberty, the hours of labor for children aged from 11 to 13 were increased from 10 to 10 and a half. The pretext? Labor in silk mills was lighter than in mills for other fabrics, and less likely in other respects also to be prejudicial to health. Official medical inquiries proved afterwards that on the contrary, the average death rate is exceedingly high in the silk districts, and amongst the female part of the population is higher even than it is in the cotton districts of Lancashire. Despite the protests of the factory inspectors, repeated every six months, this evil has lasted to the present day. The Act of 1850 replaced the 15-hour period from 6 a.m. to 8.30 p.m. by a 12-hour period from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., but only for young persons and women. It did not, therefore, affect children, who could always be employed for half an hour before this period and two and a half hours after it, provided the total duration of their labor did not exceed six and a half hours. While the bill was under discussion, the factory inspectors laid before Parliament statistics relating to the infamous abuses which had arisen from this anomaly, but in vain. In the background lurked the intention of using children to force the working day of adult males up to fifteen hours, in years of prosperity. The experience of the three years which followed demonstrated that such an attempt was bound to fail in face of the resistance of the adult male workers. The Act of 1850 was therefore finally completed in 1853 by the prohibition of the employment of children in the morning before and in the evening after young persons and women. Henceforth, with few exceptions, the Factory Act of 1850 regulated the working day of all workers in the branches of industry subject to it. By then, half a century had elapsed since the passing of the first Factory Act. Factory legislation went beyond its original sphere of application for the first time in the Print Works Act of 1845. The unwillingness with which capital accepted this new extravagance speaks through every line of the Act. It limits the working day for children from 8 to 13, and for women, to 16 hours between 6 a.m. and 10 p.m. without any legal pause for mealtimes. It allows males over 13 to be worked at will day and night. It is a parliamentary abortion. Nevertheless, the principle had triumphed with its victory in those great branches of industry which form the most characteristic creation of the modern mode of production. Their wonderful development from 1853 to 1860, hand-in-hand hand with the physical and moral regeneration of the factory workers, was visible to the weakest eye. The very manufacturers from whom the legal limitation and regulation of the working day had been wrung step by step in the course of a civil war lasting half a century now pointed boastfully to the contrast with the areas of exploitation which were still free. The Pharisees of political economy now proclaimed that their newly won insight into the necessity for a legally regulated working day was a characteristic achievement of their science. It'll be easily understood that after the factory magnates had resigned themselves and submitted to the inevitable, capital's power of resistance gradually weakened, while at the same time the working class's power of attack grew with the number of its allies and those social layers not directly interested in the question. Hence the comparatively rapid progress since 1860. Dye works and bleach works were brought under the Factory Act of 1850 and 1860, lace and stocking factories in 1861. As a result of the first report of the Commission on the Employment of Children, 1863, the same fate was shared by the manufacturers of all earthenware products, not just the potteries. Matches, percussion caps, cartridges, carpets, and fustian cuttings and the employers of people engaged in the many processes included under the name of finishing. 
In the year 1863, bleaching in the open air and baking were placed under special acts by which, in the former case, the labor of young persons and women at night was forbidden, from eight in the evening to six in the morning, and in the latter, the employment of journeyman bakers under eighteen between nine in the evening and five in the morning. We shall return to the later proposals of the same commission, which threatened to deprive all the important branches of English industry of their freedom, with the exception of agriculture, mining, and transport. Section 7. The Struggle for a Normal Working Day. Impact of the English Factory Legislation on Other Countries. The reader will recall that the production of surplus value, or the extraction of surplus value, forms the specific content and purpose of capitalist production, quite apart from any reconstruction of the mode of production itself which may arise from the subordination of labor to capital. He will remember that, from the standpoint so far developed here, it is only the independent worker, a man who is thus legally qualified to act for himself, who enters into a contract with the capitalist as a seller of a commodity. So, if our historical sketch has shown the prominent part played by modern industry on the one hand, and the labor of those who are physically and legally minors on the other, the former is still for us only a particular department of the exploitation of labor, and the latter only a particularly striking example of it. Without anticipating subsequent developments, the following points can be derived merely by connecting together the historical facts. First, Capital's drive towards a boundless and ruthless extension of the working day is satisfied first in those industries which were first to be revolutionized by water power, steam, and machinery in those earliest creations of the modern mode of production, the spinning and weaving of cotton, wool, flax, and silk. The changed material mode of production and the correspondingly changed social relations of the producers first gave rise to outrages without measure, and then called forth, in opposition to this, social control, which legally limits, regulates, and makes uniform the working day and its pauses. During the first half of the 19th century, this control therefore appears simply as legislation for exceptions. As soon as the factory acts had conquered the original domain of the new mode of production, it was found that in the meantime, many other branches of production had made their entry into the factory system properly so-called, that manufacturers with more or less obsolete methods, such as potteries, glassmaking, etc., that old-fashioned handicrafts like baking, and finally even the scattered so-called domestic industries such as nail-making, had long since fallen as completely under capitalist exploitation as the factories themselves. Factory legislation was therefore compelled gradually to strip itself of its exceptional character or to declare that any house in which work was done was a factory, as in England where the law proceeds in the manner of the Roman casuists. Second, the history of the regulation of the working day in certain branches of production, and the struggle still going on in others over this regulation, prove conclusively that the isolated worker, the worker as free seller of his labor power, succumbs without resistance once capitalist production has reached a certain stage of maturity. The establishment of a normal working day is therefore the product of a protracted and more or less concealed civil war between the capitalist class and the working class. Since the contest takes place in the arena of modern industry, it is fought out first of all in the homeland of that industry, England. The English factory workers were the champions not only of the English working class, but of the modern working class in general, just as their theorists were the first to throw down the gauntlet to the theory of the capitalists. Hence, the philosopher of the factory, Yuri, considers it a mark of inextinguishable disgrace on the part of the English working class that they wrote the slavery of the factory acts on their banners, as opposed to capital, which was striving manfully for the perfect freedom of labor. France limped slowly behind England. The French 12 Hours Law needed the February Revolution to bring it into the world, and it is far more loopholes than its English model. Nevertheless, the French revolutionary method has its own peculiar advantages. At one stroke, it dictates the same limits to the working day in all shops and factories without distinction, whereas the English legislation yields reluctantly to the pressure of circumstances, now on this point, now on that, and is well on the way to creating an inextricable tangle of contradictory enactments. Moreover, the French law proclaims as a principle what in England was only one in the name of children, minors, and women, and has only recently been claimed for the first time as a universal right. In the United States of America, every independent workers' movement was paralyzed as long as slavery disfigured a part of the republic. Labor in a white skin cannot emancipate itself where it is branded in a black skin. However, a new life immediately arose from the death of slavery. The first fruit of the American Civil War was the Eight Hours Agitation, which ran from the Atlantic to the Pacific, from New England to California, with the seven-league boots of the locomotive. 
The General Congress of Labor, held at Baltimore in August 1866, declared, The first and great necessity of the present, to free the labor of this country from capitalistic slavery, is the passing of a law by which eight hours shall be the normal working day in all states of the American Union. We are resolved to put forth all our strength until this glorious result is attained. At the same time, the beginning of September 1866, the Congress of the International Working Men's Association, held at Geneva, passed the following resolution, proposed by the London General Council. We declare that the limitation of the working day is a preliminary condition without which all further attempts at improvement and emancipation must prove abortive. The Congress proposes eight hours as the legal limit of the working day. Thus the working class movement on both sides of the Atlantic, which had grown instinctively out of the relations of production themselves, set its seal on the words of the English factory inspector R.J. Saunders. Further steps towards a reformation of society can never be carried out with any hope of success unless the hours of labor be limited and the prescribed limit strictly enforced. It must be acknowledged that our worker emerges from the process of production looking different from when he entered it. In the market, as an owner of a commodity, labor power, he stood face to face with other owners of commodities, one owner against another owner. The contract by which he sold his labor power to the capitalist proved in black and white, so to speak, that he was free to dispose of himself. But when the transaction was concluded, it was discovered that he was no free agent, that the period of time for which he is free to sell his labor power is the period of time for which he is forced to sell it. That in fact, the vampire will not let go while there remains a single muscle, sinew, or drop of blood to be exploited. For protection against the serpent of their agonies, the workers have put their heads together and, as a class, compel the passing of a law, an all-powerful social barrier by which they can be prevented from selling themselves and their families into slavery and death by voluntary contract with capital. In the place of the pompous catalogue of the inalienable rights of man, there steps the modest Magna Carta of the legally limited working day, which at last makes clear when the time which the worker sells is ended and when his own begins. What a great change from that time! 